happy to uh, <laughs> introduce uh, Dr. Lauren Esposito to everyone. Uh, Lauren is a curator at the California Academy okay. of Sciences and the Schlinger Chair of Arachnology, which is pretty amazing title. Um, and Lauren is uh, uh, going to tell you about her research on macroecology and evolution of scorpions. Turn it over to you. Oh, sort of. I'm going to talk about that and, and, and some, some other stuff, but, uh, but I guess we'll start with that since, I don't know, these academic seminars, people want to want to hear about your research, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think sort of broadly, the, the, what I'm interested in in biology is, is how things come to exist, um, both in terms of their, the, the evolutionary space that they occupy and the ecological space that they occupy. Also, I don't know if the like, rules are concerning masks for speakers. Masks yeah, on? You're, you're far enough away, you can take yours off. Okay, because then it'll probably be more clear for the audio. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to give you like a really high level overview of the kind of stuff that I've been working on uh, in recent years, and then talk to you a, quite a bit about the, the other aspect of, of my career that I that I spent a lot of time thinking about and working on, which is uh, work in, D, in DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so, I, I just want to start with like sort of why I study ecology and evolution and under the umbrella of what I would call biodiversity science, and and really like the sort of guiding philosophy of my lab is that we should be doing biodiversity science better and faster, um, and that's really because we live during this time when human development is altering the natural environment at a pace that's extremely fast. And we, as scientists, are often placed in a race to discover, collect, and describe organisms before they go extinct. Um, and this really is in a race that we're winning at this point. Uh, the rate of, of global change exceeds the rate at which we're able to do basic taxonomy and understand and document what shares the world with us, at least for, for groups like arthropods, which it would include scorpions, as far as I know. And so this the strategy that we employ is is sort of is sort of threefold. I don't know why these shift keys don't work. And there we go, maybe. Okay. Uh, the first is that we document and describe biodiversity, and in doing so, collect biodiversity data data about where things exist in time and space. Um, we use oftentimes genomic information to identify the patterns and processes that have, let, that have occurred in the past and led to the present day biodiversity. But then I think perhaps most importantly, or arguably most importantly, uh, our lab communicates the importance of biodiversity through effective outreach and education, including training a diverse generation of scientists that are representative of the global community that we, is needed to do biodiversity science, um, but also engaging local communities when and where we work, wherever in the world that is. And so I'm going to talk about about three main topics. The first is uh, a study that was that was done by my master's student who graduated last year, Aaron Goodman, on niche partitioning and congeneric scorpions. Um, the second is something that that occupies a lot of my my mental a capacity, which is Caribbean biogeography, or how things evolve on islands. Uh, and the last, as I mentioned, is, is talking about how, how, how I work to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM. So I'll start with this picture, this illustration demonstrated by this child holding an upside down book um, of this the arachnid tree of life, uh, which is an, a pretty diverse tree of life. But for me, as somebody who, who as an undergrad was really intrigued by big questions of evolution, sort of dis realized that arachnids as an evolutionary group are 430 million years old. And in that 430 million years, they've explored evolutionary niche space in almost any direction that you can imagine. So, um, I think earlier I, I mentioned to Luke, like if you think about something, if you can imagine something existing in, in, the, in your wildest dreams and what that thing would look like and what it would do, arachnids have probably done that. And so as an arachnologist, I like to think that I get to explore the far reaches of, 
like alien life on Earth, which is uh, arachnids. But I would also argue that there are really great ecological and evolutionary model as a result of this long history on Earth. So we, again, we're, we're talking about a 430 million year lineage in the, in the case of, of scorpions. Um, and scorpions are really sister to all to spiders plus allies. So they're part of this um, tetrapulmonate group, which is sort of the crown group uh, of arachnids, if you want to talk about groups as being crown. Um, there's 17 families of extant families of, of scorpions and about 2,400 species, although at the rate at which we're describing new species of scorpions, that, that's probably about 50% of the, of the true diversity uh, currently extant on Earth. They occur across all major land masses except Antarctica, although they were on Antarctica. Um, and they range in habitat from uh, 20 meters below sea level to most of the highest massives uh, on Earth, like the Alps and the Andes and the Himalayas. They're also case selected predators. Um, so from an eco ecological standpoint, uh, the, the only thing that's really limiting their population growth is their uh, resource or prey availability. Um, and they're relatively long lived. So they have a high investment in, um, uh, well, this is not a consequence of being relatively long lived, but they have a high investment in, in reproduction because the females uh, don't lay eggs, they give birth to live young. So mm -hmm. really high resource investment. Um, and I think perhaps most fascinating for, for many people is that there's this huge diversity of venoms contained within all scorpion lineages. Uh, a, any single given scorpion can have with up to 200 unique components to their venom cocktail. Um, so if you sort of scale that across all extant scorpions, that's a whole lot of venom uh, that, that does a variety of things and is typically highly specialized to, to the tissues that, that it attacks. Uh, I think more compelling in terms of, of, of evolutionary models is that recently there was a, a resolved phylogeny for scorpions. Uh, so this was just published in 2015, um, the first um, uh, genetic-based phylogeny, uh, which was which was published based on transcriptomes. Um, there's been a few subsequent publications to this that have generally recovered the same uh, basic topology for for scorpions, uh, just adding to um, the number of branches that we see. So I want to talk about this story uh, uh, that we often see in scorpions where we see multiple species, oftentimes from uh, the same genus or the same family living in the same space. And it's a, it's a kind of problem that perplexes me quite a bit because scorpions are cannibalistic. Uh, and because they're these K-selected predators and they're cannibalistic, they'll readily eat one another when they encounter one another. They'll basically overtake anything that, that, that they can. And so, how then are these organisms using essentially the same niche space or same resources able to live together in the same space? And I mean, I think the only answer that, that is logical is that they must be partitioning the niche space in some way. Um, although how they're exactly they're partitioning them, that niche space is a bit unclear. And it becomes even more unclear when you're talking about species within the same genus. Um, so this is a, a, a genus of scorpions called Centuroides or the bark scorpions, and they're, they're, they fall into a category of scorpions called errant um, because they don't dig burrows. Uh, they just walk, wander around and find crevices to reside in during the day um, and resume wandering at night. And um, some work that I did during my PhD recovered four distinct lineages within this genus. Uh, and those lineages are distinct both in terms of morphology, but also in terms of, of distribution, which with one uh, lineage, existing essentially north of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the Yucatan, uh, or just north of the Yucatan in Mexico. Uh, one that essentially exists in uh, southern Mexico and northern Central America, and one that exists from south of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec down into northern South America. And then the fourth group is uh, endemic to the Caribbean. But there exists this uh, kind of strange circumstance right around the Isthmus of Tehuantepec where you find three distinct lineages cohabitating in some of the environments, particularly um, tropical forest ecosystems. And so uh, we were really curious to understand how then these three essentially co-diversifying lineages 
were able to, to occupy this, this similar habitat. That's habitat probably given the current present day distributions um, and inferences about, about past distributions, uh, more or less the cradle of, of generic radiation for this group. Um, so where these, these group three, four, well, probably three different gen uh, subgenera first started to diversify. Uh, and so uh, my student, Aaron Goodman, um, who is now at the American Museum of Natural History, went out and, and walked transects uh, in a forest in, in the Yucatan and collected both continuous and categorical traits about the environment um, every time he spotted a scorpion. So he walked these transects every single night. Um, and he measured a number of things, including the altitude at which it was collected, the height that it was found within um, the tree story, the diameter at breast height of whatever it was perched on, so whether that was a tree or a rock, and put out data loggers to collect relative humidity and temperature over time. Um, we looked at that in a number of ways, including um, both discrete and, and, and non-discrete um, statistical analyses, including linear regression, chi-square distance, uh, combinatorial um, uh, metrics, and, and also uh, we looked at the species and the type of substrate that it was sitting on. So whether it was on the ground, like in leaf litter, or on a tree, or on a rock, or whatever thing it was sitting on. Um, but we also implemented all these categorical and continuous traits in this R package called hypervolume. Um, and hypervolume is kind of a neat concept. It was a concept proposed by Hutchinson in the 1950s, which was essentially this idea that, that, that niche space is a set of invariables that represent the requirements of a species to persist. It's sort of a three-dimensional concept of what a species um, niche is, and we use this hypervolume uh, package in R to essentially estimate what the three-dimensional niche space was for each of these three species that were cohabitating uh, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, we use the sorensen dish similarity index to um, uh, quantify what that hypervolume was, and in the, in the end what we concluded was that in these three species, we found really discrete um, characteristics upon which they were partitioning the, the habitat. The first was that there were temperature and humidity preferences across the three habitats, uh, with one species being found primarily in, pri well, actually only in primary forests, a second species being found in primary and secondary forests, and a third species being found only in secondary forest and, and pastoral and adjacent spaces. Uh, we also found that there were really discrete altitudinal, spatial, and substrate di differences within the same habitat. So for example, the species, the two species that were found in secondary forest, they were using different parts uh, partitioned across altitudinal, spatial, and substrate differences. Um, and, what, uh, and, and thirdly, what we found was the first statistical support for an, an entirely arboreal scorpion. Um, and so, so one of those three species was always found in primary forest and always found above uh, five meters in, in the forest canopy. So uh, that, that was sort of the first statistical support for this arboreal habitat that had long been considered probably a thing by most scorpion biologists because um, uh, sort of anecdotally, we had often noticed or observed these scorpions higher up in the trees. And what we suspect is that it was a, it, it, that this behavior, this arboreal adaptation um, may have arisen as an escape from interspecific predation. So allowing, um, allowing this species to, to coexist with other species that actually are much bigger uh, and more readily would consume them if, if encountered. So uh, I'm going to move away now from the, sort of the Yucatan Peninsula and, and eastward into the Caribbean and talk about a project that I've been working on and thinking about for, for a pretty long time, uh, Caribbean biogeography. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people here think about the Galapagos quite a bit. And, and the Galapagos is amazing, right? It's like these, this volcanic archipelago that's arisen out of the ocean de novo. Uh, it's really isolated. It's resulted in this beautiful in, um, endemisms that we, that we observe. The Caribbean is not like that. The Caribbean is actually like quite a hot mess of geology. Um, and in fact, it, we have these, these, four, these three discrete um, types of geology that are distributed in, in, in sort of four different groups. Um, the first, circled in, in red, is this set of islands that's sitting on the Caribbean plate. Uh, and these we call the Greater Antilles. It it's, consists of Cuba, Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. Um, and there's all kinds of oddities within that 
group of islands that I could talk about all day. For example, nobody knows where, exactly where Jamaica came from geologically. It just sort of arrived at some point in time uh, and has really distinct geology to the rest of the Greater Antilles. Uh, but then over to, to the east of the Greater Antilles, we have this, this uh, de novo volcanic arc that's split into northern and southern halves, with the northern half being older than the southern half. Um, and typically we see a, bi a biogeographic break between the northern and southern half of that archipelago. But it's a, an archipelago that's really adjacent to South America, northern South America. Um, so it's not this, this far off volcanic archipelago that things had to migrate to over, over long distances. It was act it's actually very close to, to northern South America and, and in drier periods when the, when the sea level was lower. Um, the, there, was, there were land bridges that extended almost to the southernmost island. And then we see these two other categories of islands that are con directly connected to the North and South American plate, um, up at the north and the south. Uh, that would be the Bahamas Bank, which is a bank that was created by the uplift of sediment on the North American plate as the, as the Caribbean plate pushed into it and lifted that sediment up, uh, creating this shallow um, atoll and then down at the bottom, we see the ABCs, Aruba, Curaçao, and Bonaire, um, which are not directly connected to, to South America, but, but uh, probably broke off of Northern South America at some point. Uh, but we also see islands that are directly connected through land bridges. So in the end, we have these four unique groups of islands that arose at different times, uh, that, have, have, that have different adjacencies to two vastly different uh, uh, plates, the North American plate and the South American plate. Um, so there's all these possibilities for migration. Um, that's migration basically from any direction to any given island chain and between the different island chains. Uh, so it's not a simple solution uh, to figure out where what came from where and where it went. And so it's something that I think like a lot of people have been really perplexed by, but but I think the, the bigger answer is so what? Like why should we care about Caribbean biogeography because it's not this simple evolutionary story that we can tell. And the reality is that the Caribbean has been the focus of biogeography for over 50 years. Uh, it was kind of like the origin of island biogeography was the Caribbean, right? Like that's, that's where it took place. And over 90% of terrestrial organisms, uh, particularly arthropods, are endemic to the Caribbean. But it's also a UNESCO biosphere hotspot that is, encompasses over 30 nations and territories and 230,000 square kilometers. So while we're talking about islands, we're talking about quite a considerable amount of terrestrial area in these islands. And of that terrestrial area, less than 10% is in pristine condition. It's been pretty ravaged by um, colonialism and extractive practices, resource practices for the last 400 to 500 years and really devastated by deforestation and encroachment. And I think um, this, this uh, picture here really, really illustrates the extent to which differing governances and government practices have had an effect on what, the hab what habitat is still intact and what that looks like. Uh, and this picture depicts the, the border between Haiti to the left and the Dominican Republic to the south, um, which have had really different histories of land protection and land use. Um, and to date, only about 7% of terrestrial areas in the Caribbean are in IUCN categories one to four, which are which range from fully protected with enforcement to protected in name only. Um, and in spite of all of this, this rich history of Caribbean research, uh, the stories that we tell about evolution, the legacy of colonialism and resource extraction, and the wars that have been fought quite literally over Caribbean territories, no unifying principles of biogeography have ever been proposed for the Caribbean archipelago. So how things got there, what they did once they got there and what they're doing now remain elusive. So I worked with uh, Dr. Sarah Cruz on trying to come up with some unifying themes for Caribbean biogeography based on arthropod uh, published arthropod data sets. And so what we did was we mined GenBank for uh, arthropod data sets that incorporated species that ranged across the entire Caribbean archipelago, but also included um, mainland taxa. And we were able to come up with 10 data sets. So we started off with something like 50 candidate data sets and winnowed that down to about 10. 
Um, we also had a requirement that it was a published data set with a, a known phylogeny, known, an inferred phylogeny by some expert on that taxonomic group because we, we as arachnologists certainly don't proclaim to be experts on termites or Drosophila. Um, and we ran, that, we ran those 10 data sets through 2,282 analyses in Mr. Bay's Beast and BioGeoBears. And essentially what we wanted to get at was at these snapshots in time based on geologic research, what's happened as things moved into the Caribbean and began to diversify. Uh, so we had these seven snapshots in time um, that we uh, built, constructed in BioGeoBears based on geologic data and, um, and geologic publications that range from over 40 million years ago to the present. Uh, and they all are essentially focused on what habitat was available, what land masses were available at that time. So because each of these island archipelagos came into the Caribbean at different periods in time, um, some of them were available and some of them simply didn't exist at the time frame that we, that we were referencing. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was test the, the main prevailing hypotheses about Caribbean biogeography. And there's long been sort of a feud, which we are agnostic about, uh, between people that believe Garlandia or the Greater Antilles land bridge was a thing, or people that believe that the Central American Seaway was the primary uh, mode of, of dispersal into the Caribbean. Uh, and so we had these, these seven slices in time and models that in, both included Garlandia and excluded Garlandia as a possibility. Um, we also modeled all of the potential uh, dates of closure of the Central American Seaway. So there's, quite a, there's been quite a, a number of dates of the closure proposed, uh, ranging from 23 million years ago being the oldest, all the way up to 8 million years ago um, being the youngest dates of closure. So that would be the first available landmass to disperse across. Again, we're talking about terrestrial organisms. Um, and, and I think, think what I'm most excited about or most proud of in this Caribbean biogeography study is that we came up with this rigorous model set for, for testing data against, um, along with standardized data sets for testing hypotheses. So either you can bring your data and test it against our models, or you can take our data sets and test it against your own models, um, either way. And so really trying to get at what the, the heart of what's happened in the Caribbean is. But I think most surprisingly is that our results largely conflict with pretty much all previously published interpretations, both of the phylogenies that we're using, but also um, major prevailing uh, interpretations of biogeography in the Caribbean. And so I'm going to tell you a few of the lessons that, that we learned from this set of models and this set of data. Um, the first is that South America was the most common origin for Caribbean taxa. The second is that we found we recovered dispersal is equally likely both across Garlandia or this Greater Antilles Avis land bridge that, that was hypothesized to have occurred in the Eastern Caribbean as well as over the Isthmus of Panama. And this is, this is a, a result that's probably a bias of biogeo bears, which was that junk dispersal or this really um, rare long distance dispersal was almost always favored as a model. Um, but there's biogeo bears has a known preference for preferring jump dispersal as a mechanism. But surprisingly, what we found was that reverse dispersal, so uh, organisms moving from the Caribbean into uh, North America in particular, was really prevalent. Uh, and so oftentimes we think of islands, particularly islands like the Galapagos, as a sink for diversity rather than a source. But the Caribbean seems to be the opposite, where it's a really important source for potential new world um, radiations and diversification. We found that distance is most important between islands. So things like to move from one island to the closest island rather than hopping over a few of them, which I think makes logical sense. Um, but that island monophyly or groups that radiate within an island before moving to another is pretty exceptional. So things seem to move pretty freely between islands. We found that the Greater Antilles, as, as you would predict based on their age alone, have more diversity and are older than the lesser, the lesser Antillean taxa. Uh, and that's, that, th those are all the lessons that we learned. So as far as coming up with these sort of universal rules for, for Caribbean biogeography, I think that this is a great start, but what's really gonna take is more taxa, uh, including taxa that, that are not arthropods um, to, to try to really tease apart some of, some of these important sort of lessons. 
Okay, so I want to talk, spend the rest of the time with you talking about the work that I've been doing to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM, and in particular, why I think that that's important for all of us as a scientific community to be discussing. So a few years ago, I had this sort of epiphany where I realized that I was the first openly queer curator in the oldest natural history museum west of the Mississippi. So in the 168 years of my institution, there had never been an openly queer PI or researcher who had preceded me. And I think that that's significant, particularly for one very important reason, which is that San Francisco is like the gayest city in America. And for an institution in San Francisco to have never had a gay curator in its history is saying something. It's saying something about the history of LGBTQ people in this country, uh, and in particular, our role in STEM. Uh, because for many years, for many centuries, I think LGBTQ people have had to choose between being excluded from the scientific community, as you can see from examples like Turing, Alan Turing, who was essentially exiled from the mathematical community after people learning he was gay, or have had to choose to be, remain hidden, or keep that, that part of their identity hidden. Um, and you can see a great example of that is Sally Ride, uh, who, who was a lesbian her entire life, openly known among her, her closest uh, uh, community members, but was told by NASA that she had to keep that secret if she wanted to be a, the first woman astronaut. So it's really clear that LGBTQ identifying people have been told through societal pressure within STEM that they need to separate their identity as LGBTQ from their identity as science. And that was something that I had really internalized uh, all the way up until the point that, that I had a tenure track position. Uh, and I think at that point, I really had this, uh, this moment of realization that I didn't need to separate those two things. And whatever thing had forced me to internalize that in myself, was an artificial barrier that needed to be broken down. It was a wall that needed to, to come down and stem. And I think that this is particularly true for people that have intersectional identities that include LGBTQ identities, but in addition to other historically excluded or minoritized groups, including women or people of color. So in 2018, I launched this visibility campaign with colleagues from the California Academy of Sciences called 500 Crew Scientists. Uh, and really, it had a singular goal. And the goal was for the first time for people to be able to publicly celebrate their identities as LGBTQ people alongside their identities as scientists and to celebrate their successes, not in spite of their identities, but because of them. So we launched 500 Crew Scientists uh, and it launched with a, this single tweet from me, which was I admittedly a little nerve wracking for the first five minutes or so. Um, but it didn't take long to realize that there was a lot of other people that felt the same way. And so I took a step back because in addition to identifying as LGBTQ, I also identify as a Hispanic person that grew up in the United States. Um, I'm from the border of the US and Mexico and grew up in a community that's 90% Hispanic. Uh, and so I had an unusual experience of a childhood spent not as a minority, but a childhood spent within the majority of the group that I belong to. And it wasn't until I left El Paso, which is where I grew up, and moved to New York City that I suddenly, for the first time, found myself surrounded by peers who didn't have share this, that same identity. And so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what the experience has been like for people who identify as the minority as they move through their educational trajectory. Um, and I wanted to share a few of the things that I found uh, with you. The first is that underrepresented minorities, as defined by the National Science Foundation, have six-year bachelor's degree completion rates that are half that of their Asian or white peers. So they're just not graduating. Um, women, regardless of their aptitude tests coming into college, or their um, grades perform worse than men in introductory STEM classes in universities. And first-generation students, regardless of their socioeconomic background, though tending to have a lower socioeconomic background, have the highest dropout rates of any single group. 
But I think the thing that's that's like worrisome most for me as a biologist is that life science undergrads make up only 17 or Black, Latino, and Native American students only make up 17% of the student population nationally, but 30% of the population national, nationally. So their enrollment in biology majors is half that of their populational representation in the US. So what's happening? Like, why don't they, why don't they enroll as biology majors when they enter college? Like they're entering college. We are entering college. And yet we're choosing not to major in life sciences. And as a biologist, like I want biology to be representative of the human population because I think we're up against some pretty grand challenges, uh, including like perhaps arguably uh, some of the highest biodiversity loss, highest biodiversity extinction rates uh, in history, um, certainly being exacerbated by human change. And yet, the people that are working on the solutions to these problems are not representative of the world in which we're living. But I think for me, the bigger problem is these ways that your identities intersect. And so I started, you know, reflecting about back on the period of time in which I was finishing as a PhD. Uh, I, I moved from Texas, which is this gray state in this map down at the south, up to New York City, which was this dark purple state up on this map up to, the, up to the right, and then across the country to California, which is another dark purple state. And at the time that I was doing all of this, without really intentionally understand, without really directly understanding why I was choosing to go to the places that I was going, the reality was that the states that I was living in were some of the only states in the country where being LGBTQ was a protected class of employment. So Texas, where I grew up, I could have shown up to work once I got a faculty job or as a graduate student TA and been fired because somebody found out I was gay. So I think that for LGBTQ people up until two years ago when it became a federally class, federally protected class of employment. Many people looked at this map or internalized this map and realized that the places that they could go to get jobs were limited. And I think that the reality of that often meant that people attritioned out of life sciences or STEM generally before they ever got through the door or got all the way through the door. Maybe they just had one foot in. But I think that there's other reasons that 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 really have affected what's estimated to be 110,000 people currently missing from the STEM workforce in America that identifies LGBTQ based on attrition rates. Um, and those start at the undergraduate level. So on US college campuses, uh, transgender and gender nonconforming students have the highest on campus sexual assault and misconduct rates of any student group on campus. That's not just like being alive, it's being on the university campus, which you know, I think for most people is like a safe space. 60% uh, of LGBTQ identifying students as undergraduates throughout their undergraduate tenure report incidences of sexual misconduct and harassment, not necessarily on campus, but while they're undergrads. Uh, so that means that for LGBTQ identifying students, oftentimes they're going through experiences of violence while also supposed to be focusing on their studies, which I think is difficult. Uh, but but here's the I think here's here is the really the big problem for LGBTQ identifying students who major in biology and participate in a research experience as a biology undergrad, they're eight percent more likely to leave STEM than their than their heterosexual cisgender peers, which means that the experience of participating in research, which for for most groups is the highest indicator of continuance in STEM, these people leave, right? And so the question is why? Why would you experience research? This is like this thing that's so exciting when you're an undergrad, you experience research for the first time and you're like, wow, I can be a scientist. Like there's stuff I can do. It's this kind of epiphany moment, I think for most of us that had that first experience of research, people, makes people wanna leave. And the answer is really what happens culturally within STEM. Uh, and to answer that, we have to look at the faculty level. And this really extends across all fields. So it's not restricted to biology. It's not restricted to physics or math. It's everything in STEM. 
Um, and and we can find we can find evidence for that uh, looking at the at the very few studies that have been published because we don't collect data about LGBTQ identities um, on the National Science Foundation uh, annual graduate student survey. So we actually have no idea how many LGBTQ people work in STEM, leave STEM, stay in STEM, get advanced, get jobs. We have lit, we're data deficient, right? So we can't really draw any any real conclusions conclusions. So the majority of information we have comes from self-reported survey data. Um, and the American Chemical Society surveyed all of their members, and 44% of the respondents reported being, being made to feel excluded, intimidated, or harassed at work. Uh, a survey across all STEM fields, but, but focusing on academic STEM fields, uh, or academic positions found that 40% of people are not out to their colleagues, which is on par with the national average that we estimate. We also don't collect it in the, in the national census, so damn data deficient. But, and like, I would say that that's like, great, like we're doing good, right? 40% are not out to their colleagues, but that's the same as the national level across all industries. But the answer is it's not good. And it's not good because universities are supposed to be safe spaces where your freedom of expression is welcomed. And that's true in sociology and women's studies and que queer studies uh, and Chicano studies and all of those departments where people are absolutely out and open about their LGBTQ identities. But when you turn to STEM, what you see is this reversion back to the national average. Uh, and it's really because for people that are out, 69% of people who are out in their university department report being made to feel uncomfortable within their department by their most immediate colleagues and peers. So when you imagine an undergraduate student experiencing research for the first time in the department, I mean, in the lab of somebody who makes their colleagues in their department feel uncomfortable, it's pretty clear why they're leaving and deciding to switch into a non-life sciences or non-STEM major. Because this culture sucks. Uh, and this, again, is true across all disciplines. Uh, so the American Physical Society um, did, a, did a, a study about the, the climate for LGBTQ physicists in 2015 and concluded that there's a heterosexist climate that reinforces gender role stereotypes in STEM work environments. I mean, this isn't good. It's not good for LGBTQ identifying people, but it's also not good for women. Uh, similarly, Mathis et al. in a qualitative study across all STEM fields concluded that heteronormative assumptions frequently silence conversations about gender and sexuality in STEM workplaces, which means that we're just not talking about it. And so going back to when I started 500 Career Scientists in 2018, it was to stand up against this idea that we shouldn't talk about that, that, that there's some part of our LGBTQ identities that we should keep hidden, or that there's some, some inclination to, even when we're never explicitly told that. So I launched 500 Career Scientists. I launched it with 50 stories that I had collected by email. Um, and I was like pretty excited about that. 50 stories, like that felt like a huge accomplishment already. Um, and in fact, I, at the time I was launching, I spoke to the president of the largest LGBTQ professional society um, at the time who told me that I would never get to 500. And I had named it 500 Career Scientists sort of uh, in honor of the 500 Women Scientists organization uh, and movement and what they had done to promote equity and inclusion and community among women scientists. Uh, and so I was like, okay, I've got 50. It's not 500, but movement in the right direction. Uh, and we launched with a website and social media presence on Instagram and Twitter. Um, that was three years ago. Today we have six, over 1,600 contributors from around the world, uh, mostly English speaking countries, although not exclusively. Um, and they've contributed their story of their celebration of their identity as being LGBTQ uh, and a scientist or science policymaker or science educator. Um, we have a social community of about 30,000 people and we get somewhere between five and 10,000 or unique visitors to our website every month. Uh, so certainly there's a demand for this kind of content and this kind of community um, that I think is, is, is undeniable. And it's really like things like this. Uh, this was this was a tweet posted like one month after the launch of the campaign. And it's really summed up for me like many of the elements of things that I had felt throughout my career uh, and reinforced that I was not the only person feeling that and, and, and 
The tweet reads, I hadn't met, let alone known of any LGBTQ STEM faculty until grad school and constantly even still questioned where my place in this field is, if it exists at all. Um, and I think that that, you know, is all the things that I had been feeling, but without verbalizing them, without vocalizing them. Uh, and this person was out there somewhere in the world, like sort of repeating the same things that were in my head. Uh, but I, I haven't stopped there. Um, I haven't stopped with 500 Career Sciences. Uh, and in fact, just this year, I applied for a grant to, to create an exhibit about LGBTQ and STEM identities. Uh, it's called New Science. It just launched on the public floor of the California Academy of Sciences um, with a handful of the 23 stories that are being told in first person through uh, photos, video, and, and first person narratives. Um, we also have a fully digital exhibit available on the Cal Academy's Google Arts and Culture platform. Um, so if you're at home and would like to experience the in, and immerse yourself in the culture of LGBTQ STEM, you can go and, and, and visit this, this exhibit and, and hear these people tell their stories and celebrate their successes in their own voice. Um, and it's also freely available to any public space in the world. So if anybody wants to print uh, any of the 23 stories out, they each have a QR code that links to a, a page that includes all of the multimedia available for that person. Um, it's, it's free, we, we have it. It's a resource. Uh, hopefully other museums will, will display this exhibit as well. Uh, and, and it's been quite, quite a, a fun experience getting, getting to produce my first ever exhibit. In spite of being at a science museum, I've never made a science exhibit. Uh, and to my knowledge, it's the first exhibit ever focused on telling the stories of LGBTQ scientists. Uh, I'm also working on, on other aspects. I'm really trying to reflect on what I as an individual can do within my personal professional societies to make a change. Um, and so in June of 2020, um, some colleagues launched this project called Entomologists of Color, uh, really in response to the academic strike for Black Lives. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to get involved with this initiative. Um, and essentially what we've done over the last year and a half is we've raised about $15,000 to support early career scientists at the first level of inclusion in becoming a professional scientist. And that's participating in professional societies. So we, it's really simple concept. We pay for their society fees. Uh, then they can participate. They have access to journals. They have access to network building. They have access to conferences. Um, we're also supporting conference attendance uh, and pairing the people that attend conferences with mentors who are experienced uh, within that society so that they can like get to know people. I think going to a conference for the first time, one of the scariest things is you don't know anyone uh, or don't know how to meet people. Um, so I just want to talk quickly about sort of what the what the background motivation for, for uh, this was. This is a, a study that was uh, that was led by Evangelista et al, um, a group of entomologists uh, who looked at data from 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 the NSF graduate student survey about the representation of uh, uh, ethnic groups and genders in STEM. Um, and so this is sort of like the at the at the at the courses scale um, across all science and engineering and across biological sciences. There's not data on Native Americans because the, the, there were so few Native Americans reporting in the survey that that there's nothing to visualize. Um, but what this shows is if, if the circle is, so it's, it's males and females, right? Uh, males being the orange on the right and, and females being the, I don't know, magenta on the left. Um, and it's, if the circle, if the half of the circle is smaller than the gray outline, then they're underrepresented. And if it's bigger than the gray outline, then they're overrepresented um, as compared to, to, to the um, population. Um, and so here we can see that that actually everyone's underrepresented across all STEM. So there are fewer people proportionally um, engaging in STEM careers than is anticipated based on the US population level. But in particular, when you look at biological sciences, what you can see is that um, Black or African Americans and Hispanics or Latinos are severely underrepresented, particularly um, Latino males. 
are severely underrepresented. But what we were really interested in, or what uh, and Ben and Lisa at all were really interested in, was what was happening within entomology and how that compared to biological sciences. Um, and this is the finest grain at which you can um, get get this data, the, the finest grain at which the data is collected. So it, it lumps entomology and parasitology together. But you can see when compared to all biological sciences, entomology and parasitology have a real problem. Um, and that problem is that uh, Black people are severely underrepresented and Hispanics or Latinos are severely underrepresented, particularly Hispanic males. Um, and the same is true for, for ecology. Uh, there's no evolutionary biology on this on this um, figure, but but uh, you can imagine a similar trajectory. I think 1% of, of Black Americans are awarded PhD. Well, 1% of the, of the evolutionary biology PhDs in this country are awarded to Black Americans today. So uh, yeah, what, we don't even need to report that data, but um, you can see that, 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 that there's a real problem. And so the solution that, that entomologists of color came up with was a really simple one. And that's how do we get, how do we recruit people to become entomologists? Uh, and super simply, we give them free professional society memberships and then like help them engage with that professional society to decide whether or not that, that's a career trajectory for them. So, so far we've provided over 300 society memberships. We've raised about $15,000. Uh, we've piloted a mentorship program um, where we've given people, um, we've given away about, we've, last year we supported 50 people to attend the Entomological Society of America conference and paired them with mentors, um, regardless of whether or not they were presenting, because oftentimes the bar for applying for um, support to attend conferences is that you have to present. But if you're an undergrad, you're like, you might not be ready to present, you just might want to meet people to decide whether or not that's a career for you. Uh, and we're gonna repeat that this year uh, with another 50 um, scholarships to attend the conference. Uh, and we've also started a science, uh, scientist of the month highlight. So we're highlighting every month an entomologist of color on social media, as well as all the instars, which are the people that have been supported by the program so far. But I wanna end this talk on what everybody else can do because minorities or historically excluded or underrepresented people are historically underrepresented and excluded because there are fewer of them. So therefore, the majority would be the allies. And so it's important for allies to participate in the process of DEI if we're really gonna ever change the culture of STEM. So the first thing I wanna say is that allyship is active. If you consider yourself an ally and you reflect on what you've done in the last year of your life to demonstrate that allyship and the answer is that you can't think of anything, then you're not actually an ally. You may intend to be one, but you're not one because it's active. You have to actively act to be an ally. Um, but there are a few really simple things that you can do. Uh, the first is that you can make space for historically excluded voices and in particular amplify them. So don't repeat what they said, don't co-opt what they said, actually take that person and give them a platform from which to speak. Uh, normalizing the use of pronouns is a really easy thing to practice allyship, uh, oftentimes, when people use pronouns that don't necessarily uh, match what you might ex anticipate their gender identity to be, it stands out. But if everybody begins to use pronouns, it's uh, less, of, less of a thing that stands out. I think the most important one is probably this one, which is that you should listen to what people say when they feel upset. It's okay for you to feel ashamed or embarrassed. It's more important that you recognize the mistakes that you made, that you learn from those mistakes and that you move forward. And an example of this is as simple as misgendering someone using the wrong pronouns. You don't need to belabor that you use the wrong pronouns. You just need to recognize that you made a mistake, acknowledge it, and move forward. Then everybody's happy. Um, and I think another one that's really simple is leading through example. I think for, for a really long time in STEM, we have this idea that we should not talk about our personal lives. Like we should come to work with our white lab coat on and be scientists and not talk about our families or our dogs or our hobbies. We should just show up to work. I'm gonna think that that works when everybody's the same, but the moment that there's an other introduced into the room, they really stand out. But by normalizing that everyone is humans, they're individuals, they have unique lives and humans that are attached to them and oftentimes animals and hobbies and all sorts of things, then it really starts to take away from the otherness and just represent people as individuals uh, and as our scientific society is a collection of individuals rather than a uniform thing. But I, 
think the most important one these days is that you should challenge discrimination. I think we've all witnessed discrimination and oftentimes we don't know what to do in that moment. Um, but the best thing to do, if you can think of it, which oftentimes I find I can't, is to intervene by asking the person to stop uh, and explain to them why it's not okay what they're doing. Oftentimes they don't even realize they're doing something wrong. There's like, as we evolve into this equitable and inclusive society, there's so many rules. There's all these rules that suddenly we all have to learn and we all have to catch up with learning how to make sure that we're respectful to everyone's identities. And sometimes you mess up. And if somebody just explains to you how you messed up, like you're probably oftentimes receptive to that. You can just change the subject. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. Um, and it will stop that conversation. And if you can't think of something right in that moment, you can always do something later, like talk to that person later on, engage in a conversation, send them a note. Um, or if it's something really serious, you can raise the issue with someone who has more authority than you uh, to deal with the problem. There's almost always somebody higher up, especially in these like academic, very bureaucratic institutions. And the last thing I want to share with you is something that I think is like the best, one of the best examples of um, really advocating and demonstrating allyship uh, that I've ever seen. And, and this is a transcript that I typed um, from a screenshot that somebody posted in response to the 500 Career Sciences campaign in the early days after it first started. And I don't know either of the people, but it was written from uh, a, uh, a dean or department chair, I can't remember which, to a faculty member. Uh, and I'm gonna read it for anybody that, that can't see or, or has difficulty reading. And it says, Dear Aaron, I wanted to reach out to you to let, actually, it doesn't say that, let me try again. Dear Aaron, I wanted to reach out to let you know that I saw that you are publicly identifying as non-binary and to assure you that you have my support. I also wanted to check in on whether there are any changes you would like me to make in the way that I or the team talks to you or refers to you, for example, name or pronouns or anything else that will help affirm your identity. Finally, please know you can come to me with any frustrations or concerns related to this or anything else. You're a great scientist and I'm proud to have you on the team. Regards, Nigel. And I have no idea who Nigel is, but I share this every time I give a talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I think he, he, they are doing a really great job of demonstrating allyship. Uh, and with that, I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation to, to talk. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions in the time that's left and uh, feel free to email me anytime if you have questions or concerns or just want to chat. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I'd like to express my gratitude um, to both IIDS and BCB for allowing the BCB students this opportunity to invite seminar speakers. Um, so that's really great for covering what's happening, Dr. Linus, to go through this. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, sure. thank you. <laughs> So I had a question about Jamaica. Yeah. Um, you're talking about how the older land masses in the Caribbean have more diversity. Mm -hmm. Can you like, instead of starting with the, the geology and then looking at the evolution, can you go backwards in Jamaica and look at the amount of diversity and does it correspond at all to different theories about the age or the possible creation of Jamaica? Yeah, so um, the question is, can you go backwards with Jamaica and try to figure out based on the present day diversity, like what the sort of the origins of the island are? And in some ways, yes, but in other ways, um, it, it's even more difficult in Jamaica because Jamaica was like so almost entirely submerged. And so the only things that, that remain on Jamaica tend to be relictual either for Central American fauna or for Caribbean fauna by and large. Um, so. So uh, the fauna overall in Jamaica is relatively young compared to the other greater Antillean islands. It's mostly, mostly, we think that the only thing that remained above water is the Blue Mountains, which is in um, the eastern part of the island. 
Also, everything's kind of messed up in, in Jamaica is sort of a mess. <laughs> yeah, they, they uh, cut down all their primary forests except for one patch of forest in uh, the southern Jamaica near Kingston, which was on limestone karst and so like really difficult to access and cut down and not worth it for agriculture because it was karstic. Um, everything else was like has been cut down at least once. Okay, let's thank Dr. Thank you.